Well, we are in part four of our series, Vital Optimism, on Ultimate Hope. And if you were here last week, you know I said uh, uh, we are finishing up our series. Well, we changed, <laughs> I changed my mind. We're, uh, this is probably, probably going to be the end of the series. We're wrapping it up. But we're talking about how important it is to have, have optimism, have this vital optimism. And I was reading just this week that um, and people who are optimistic and faith-filled on average live 10 years longer uh, than people that are not, that are pessimistic and negative all the time. So I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. That's, that's pretty important. But we've talked about how uh, this kind of optimism is so important because it's a kind of optimism that goes beyond circumstances, goes beyond the things that are going on in our life. It goes to the point where we can say, it is well with my soul. So today we're going to talk about ultimate hope, ultimate hope, uh, which involves a question is there a hope that you and I can count on when every other hope lets us down? Because eventually every other hope will. So I want to start by asking this question, what are you hoping for? What are you hoping for? Like, we all are kind of hopers by nature. You know, we, we, we hope when we get up in, our morn, in the morning and we open our eyes and we have hopes for that day and we have hopes for the next day. Uh, we long and wait for the things that we desire. You know, people who are in school, like, they're anxious to graduate school, right? Two and a half more days, anxious to graduate school, or at least to get out of school for the summer. But then we, we look to graduate, and then we're single, and, and often we hope to get married. And when we get married, we often hope to have kids and get kids in the house. And then we, we hope to get kids out of the house sometimes. And, and we just can't, you know, all of these hopes and, and desires and dreams, we're all by nature hopers. We all hope. We all have these hopes. And hopes come in all sizes, Researchers in this field have distinguished between kind of like big optimism and, and little optimism. And little optimism is those things that involve kind of specific uh, daily expectations, you know, for a particular outcome. I hope I pass the test. I, I hope my car will work. I, I hope I have a good day when I go to work. Big optimism is about global expectations, you know, just kind of like, like a basic orientation or disposition toward the future. Uh, I, I hope my life will go well. You know, that's a big one. There's big optimism and little optimism. And to kind of help us get some clarity on this, I thought we'd do a quick little quiz here. So we're going to have a quiz. Okay, the category is items that people might hope for. I mean, items people hope for. And you're going to tell me, is this big optimism or is this little optimism? Okay, the, for number one, world peace will break out today. Big optimism or little? Big, that's big optimism, right? Uh, world peace, holy cow, that's, big, uh, that's a big optimism deal. How about number two? I'll find a good parking place at Walmart next time I go. Yeah. Ah, that's kind of little, kind of little. How about this one? When I leave Walmart, I'll remember where I parked. Uh, that might be big depending on how your memory works, I suppose. How about this one? The Vikings will win the Super Bowl. <laughs> that's huge, yeah, right? How about this one? Jesus will return. Yeah, that's a big one. How about this one? The Vikings will win the Super Bowl before Jesus returns. <laughs> yeah, okay, well, that might be pretty big. But you have hopes, and the person next to you have hopes. Uh, and some of them are big ones, and some of them are little ones. And sometimes, like, the hopes don't work out, even the big ones, the vital ones. Uh, sometimes they do, other times not so much. See, optimism alone can stand on pretty shaky ground. I did some research on this, and uh, one of the things that they found was that optimistic people are not always real, like, accurate predictors of reality, perceivers. You know, they don't perceive reality necessarily uh, as, as well. There, there's, they did a landmark study in this area where they got a bunch of people in a room, and uh, they got, gave them some time to kind of get to know each other, and then they rated uh, how much they liked the other people in the room. And then they did a second rating where the other people rated, you know, how much they liked me. So I would rate you, you would rate me. And what they found out is that optimists actually overestimated how much they were liked by other people. Optimists commonly thought other people liked them who didn't like them at all. Turns out that, like, slightly depressed people were actually more accurate perceivers of reality than optimists were, which led to, like, huge debates in this field, like, which is better, to be realistic and sad or optimistic and happy? Yeah, like serious debates about this kind of thing. But one of the things I want to do today is kind of distinguish between human optimism and Christian hope, because I think Christian hope is made of much sterner stuff. I believe one of the tests of authentic Christian hope is that it can stand up to reality, and any reality, and it's not built on delusion. Sometimes we have hopes, real, real big hopes, vital hopes, that, that are disappointing. You know, what do you do then? 
You know, some of you had hopes for a relationship, and for one reason or another, they were dashed. What do you do? Some of you had dreams about a family or hopes about a job, you know, about a business or something you wanted to launch or, or to start or you know, something you wanted to do, you know, a mark you wanted to make in the world. And that hope has not been fulfilled, and maybe it never will. Every day, there's people who hope to get a, a good report back from the doctor saying everything's fine, but the report doesn't say that. When you have a big, vital hope, and it's core to what your future like, looks like to you, like, and you realize it's going to be di- disappointing, what do you do? Bruce Meads writes about a situation like this at an uh, outpatient AIDS clinic back in the 90s uh, at Los Angeles County Hospital. Tammy Kramer uh, was there. She was watching a young man who had come in one morning for his regular dose of medicine. He sat in tired silence on a high clinic stool while a new doctor at the clinic poked a needle into his arm and without looking up at his face said, you're aware, aren't you, that you are not long for this world, a year at most. Well, the patient stopped by Tammy's desk on his way out. His face twisted with pain, and he hissed, that SOB took away my hope. And Tammy Kramer said, I guess he did. Maybe it's time to find another one. Maybe it's time to find another hope. That's the question. Is there another hope? That's the question when you get the news, like you're not long for this world. Is there another hope? The Apostle Paul writes to the church at Rome, and he's talking about suffering and how suffering is not always like an altogether bad thing because he says suffering can produce perseverance, and perseverance can produce character, and character can produce hope. And then he says these words. He says, and hope does not disappoint. Like, what's he talking about here? Because I live in a world where hope disappoints every day. People have real big, vital hopes sometimes really good hopes, and they get crushed. And some of you have experienced this. Sometimes hope has disappointed so much like you just stop hoping because it hurts too much when the hope gets crushed. In this world, hope disappoints all the time. And sooner or later, the news is going to come to everybody in this room that came to Tammy's patient. You're not long for this world. And an optimist may not face this squarely, but wise people do. We human beings spend a lot of time ignoring and avoiding and suppressing the most irrefutable fact in the world. I'm going to die, and you're going to die. We try to get real busy and distracted and just not think about this truth because it's too big for us. We're, we're all going to die. We don't like to think about that or talk about that. You know, life, that's okay. You know, we'll talk about life. We sing songs about life. We play a game called life. We buy life insurance, which is kind of odd because what do you have to do to get it? You have to die, yeah. We don't call it death insurance because that'd be too depressing. One of the most popular cereals is life cereal. You know, you think they'd ever come out with a a cereal called death? You know, for people who like to wake up real slow? (laughs) Just try that one, yeah. No, I'll have a bowl of death. Mikey likes it. We don't use the D word much, but it's coming my way. There's one certain truth about me. As sure as I stand before you today, The day is coming when I will not stand. Death will come my way and yours too. And for most of us, because for better or worse, like we don't know when that day will be, like we we could just spend large portions of our life or even our entire life just pretending the day will never come. But it will. And it will defeat every hope that anybody has for any future days on this side of the grave. So maybe it's time to find another hope. That's the question. It's really the question, is there another hope? And I'm here to tell you today, the writers of Scripture say there is. And this is Christian hope that has been kept alive by the church of Jesus Christ for 2,000 years now. And it's much deeper stuff than mere human optimism, like uh, the hope or expectation that everything is going to turn out okay uh, eventually. Paul talks about what has become known as the three Christian virtues, faith and love, and right in the middle of those, is hope. It's central to the Christian life. This, Paul says, is the hope that will not disappoint. And it gets summarized by another hoper by the name of David uh, as his ultimate hope. The end of Psalm 23, David says this. He says, surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. 
Those words have probably been spoken at more funeral services in the last couple thousand years than any other words in the world. What does David mean when he says, surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life? Well, what he's not saying is that bad things are never going to happen to me because bad things did happen to him. Bad things happened to Jesus. You know, he was beaten and, and killed. And, and very bad things happened to his friends, his followers. They were persecuted for their faith. Many of them were martyred for it. Doesn't mean bad things are not going to happen to me in this life. The statement means that these bad things, no matter how bad they are, they are ultimately unable to separate me from God's care and God's love and that he'll be with me in this life no matter what happens. Whatever phone call I get, whatever doctor's message or lab report, God will be there in the unlikeliest of places and in the darkest of hours. God will be with me. God is my hope through all the days of my life and he'll be with me through death. And death actually is not even the end of me. It will be the beginning of real life. Really will. That's Christian hope. This is ultimate hope. This is what David and Paul counted on when every other hope disappointed them. This is the hope that nothing could defeat, not even death. This alone is the hope that will not disappoint. Because every other hope you have, someday will disappoint. Now here's another question. What, is, what does he mean when he says, I, I, I hope I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever? What does that, what does that look like? What's he talking about there? What's it going to look like to, to dwell in the house of the Lord? It's kind of a strange thing to me because this hope is at the heart of the Christian faith. It's our whole eternity rests on this hope. But there's lots of people, maybe most people in our society, who have never given serious, adult, sober thought to what lies on the other side of the grave. They've never examined that hope closely. Sometimes that's true for even people who have been in churches for a long time. Well, have sort of these goofy ideas of what heaven is going to be like. Some people just think it's, it's an eternal pleasure factory, right? You're always happy and you get these amazing superpowers and you can do whatever you want. Uh, I like in the movie Defending Your Life, heaven is depicted as a place where you can eat all the carbs and fat you want because they don't have any calories. I like that one. I, I kind of, yeah, hope that one might be part of that. But sometimes I hear people say something like this. You know, I know I'm supposed to want ha heaven. You know, I'm, I know I'm supposed to be hoping for that. That's the hope of my life. But frankly, heaven sounds a little boring, right? Kind of gets summarized in this Far Side cartoon. Wish I brought a magazine. <laughs> and I just kind of like sitting there like, oh, now what, you know? See, some people have this idea of heaven as sort of the ultimate retirement village, you know, so the idea is that you can, you can uh, live and work and have adventure and risk in this life, but then after you die, it's sort of like an eternal weekend in Palm Springs. And I've heard people say things like, you know, well, will there be golf in heaven? Because, you, know, you know, I can't be happy unless I'm golfing, and, you know, heaven has to make me happy, so there must be golf. And theologically, it's true that heaven is presented as a place of ultimate joy, but maybe you'll need to be changed so you can rejoice in what it is heaven offers. Like, do you really believe God made you and saved you for nothing more significant than an eternal round of golf? Besides, we know there's not going to be any lying or swearing or cheating in heaven, so how could there be golf? <laughs> Bible does say there is a destination where there will be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, which sounds a lot more like a golf course to me. But, yeah. See what, see what the Bible writers speak when they talk about heaven. They're speaking about a spiritual reality that's real difficult to explain to people like us, who haven't experienced it. They use images and pictures to express what's far beyond our experience. It's like if you or I had to explain to somebody from a couple thousand years ago, like what a car was and how it worked, or, or a rocket ship or something like that, we'd have to use images and ideas and things from their context. And that's what scripture writers do. And as a result, like a lot of, picture, a lot of people kind of get that, that far side cartoon picture of heaven inv involving harps and halos because they don't understand the spiritual reality that these images are trying to convey. So basically what happens is they find themselves not really hoping for, for what is the ultimate hope in Christian faith because they've never really thought about it in a grown-up way. There's just kind of this, this cartoon picture of this. So I want to walk you through just kind of some of the images that the biblical writers use to describe this ultimate hope. And I want us to get some clarity on this. And then at the end of the message, I'm going to tell you how this hope can be yours if it's not already. So it's real important stuff today. One of the images the biblical writers use involves singing. 
The Bible talks a lot about singing going on in the afterlife, and some of you are not too sure how you feel about that. In the adventures of Huckleberry Finn, Mark Twain uh, uh, writes that the widow Douglas describes heaven as a place where all a body would have to do was go around all day long with a harp and sing forever and ever. Now, if you got a voice like, like Jen's, maybe that's not such a bad deal, but I know some of you are thinking like, well, that may be heaven for me, but it's going to be hell for the person next to me, right? I, yeah, see, the reason Bible talks about singing is because throughout history, when the human heart is just too full to express uh, its emotions, people just sing. You know, people sing at weddings because they, they just need to express love. People will sing at funerals when they're saying goodbye to somebody they love so desperately. And they just desperately need hope. Little kids will just sing spontaneously when they're happy. The singing just has a way of expressing wonder and awe and beauty and joy and love and admiration in a way nothing else can. And that's been true throughout human history. So the writers of Scripture speak about this as a place of singing. You know, the day is coming when your heart is going to be so full, as full as it's possible for a human heart to be. And it's just you're going to experience God in person. It just kind of blows your mind. I mean, imagine what it's going to be like to, to be with God, the God of the universe, face to face, you and him. The God who made you, the God who loves you, who sent his son to die on the cross for your sins. With all the barriers removed and, and just unfettered love and delight in his heart for you and in your heart for him. The Bible says you will experience in that moment a wonder and awe and joy you cannot even express or even imagine. So the writers try to express it with inexpressible images like, like, you will go out with joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills will burst into song before you and all the trees of the field will clap their hands because they're obviously not Presbyterian, right? They're, yeah, they're just going to, all the creation is just going to rejoice and celebrate in this unimaginable glory and splendor. And you're going to be at, at the head of this parade because you're going to see God. The day is coming when you will know joy like that. How would you like to have a hope like that? Another image we find a lot in Scripture is the image of a throne. Like we're going to be gathered around a throne in the life to come. And a throne is not a real common piece of furniture in our culture. Uh, Like... other, not talking about sitting on the throne. I'm talking about like an actual throne. Like back in scripture days, like a throne is a picture of justice. Like th- you have this image of God sitting on his throne, surrounded by his people. And, and he's just surrounded by this community of love and, and it, ruled by perfect fairness and justice and goodness. And if, if people are ever going to get any justice at all, that's where they're going to go for it. Because justice is pretty hard to find in our world kind of hard to come by. My favorite story about this uh, is related by John Ortberg, who saw it in the LA Times years ago. A guy named David Hagler was stopped by a police officer for driving too fast in the snow. And he tried to tell the officer, you know, he's normally really careful and, you know, like he's kind of worried about his insurance going up and could he please not get a ticket this time? But the officer's playing hardball to him. He writes out the ticket and he's like, tell it to the judge. Gives it to him. Well, the, a couple months later, Hagler is serving as an umpire in a summer league, summer baseball league. And the first day, the first person to come up to bat is the same police officer. And the police officer looks at him and recognizes, they recognize each other. And he says, oh, how'd the, how'd the thing with the judge go? And Hagler says, swing at everything. <laughs> yeah. See, justice can be pretty hard to come by in this world. I don't know anybody, even the most optimistic person who can look around and just go, like, not ask, where's justice? Like, what is wrong? What, is it ever going to be set right? W- will it ever be redeemed? The Bible says it will. The Bible says, among other things, that our God is a just God. And the day is coming when justice is going to roll like a river. And, and all the hatreds and violence and divisions and, and killing is just going to be gone. And, and all those who are God's children in this life are to become agents to work for justice in all sections of society and in all communities on the earth. And the day is coming when we're going to be gathered around a throne. The Apostle John has this vision of this. He says, Around the throne I saw gathered a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language. I mean, think about that. Like 2,000 years ago, long before talk of multiculturalism and, and diversity and immigration policy, all that, like the days come, in the Bible says, when gathered around this throne will be people from every nation and, and, and tribe and, and people and language. And they're going to be one. 
we're all going to be one. We're all going to be singing together. And there, there's going to be no more drive-by shootings and no more hatred and, and violence and only mutual respect and love and peace and justice. And we're all going to be brothers and sisters. That's Christian hope. That, that is ultimate hope. Another image we find often involves housing. Many of you know Jesus' famous statement along these lines where he says, my father's house has many rooms. And I'm going to go there and prepare a place for you. And I always remember this one because I, when I was like 10 years old, 12, somewhere in there, I was visiting my cousin in Michigan, and uh, he took me to his church. They were having a revival service or something. They had this fundamentalist preacher up there speaking about how good the King James was and bad the other translations were because um, he, he used this. He's like, well, you know, like in the King James Version, it says, we're going to be many mansions. He goes, what happened to my mansions? I want my mansions back. And I'm like, Okay, you know, he's got to get his mansions back, you know, and go to the King James Version. Well, what happens is the King James Version, like, mistranslated this one word back in the 17th century because the point Jesus is making is not that you're going to get your dream house that you've always wanted. It's that you're going to be home. One day you're going to be home. Like, that is one of the most powerful, evocative words in the English language. Home. There's a hunger inside everybody in this room to feel fully accepted to fully belong, to, to be deeply at peace and, and have a secure identity and we're a place where we're going to be known and loved and prized and chosen. Home. The truth is, in this world, we will not be fully home. But the day is coming. Some of the greatest words ever written come from Scripture in the final vision of John. He says, in the future, God's dwelling place will now be among people and he will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He'll wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. One day we will be home and our hearts will be filled with inexpressible joy and God himself will dwell in the midst of his people with inexhaustible love and justice, and you can be there. And your character and your conscience will be cleansed. You'll never again do or say or think anything that will cause even the slightest regret. There will no longer be a sense of inadequacy or weakness or guilt or shame. You will be a creature who reflects beautifully and uniquely and perfectly the image of God. That's Christian hope. My question for you today is, is that your hope? How do you know? When we talked uh, about this phrase in Psalm 23, well, maybe the most remarkable part of that statement we looked at is David's first word, where he said, Surely, surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Surely, certainly, for sure, it's a done deal. This is my ultimate hope, that whatever else happens and whatever other disappointments I have in life, I can count on this one. It doesn't mean you never have any doubts or fears. It means that God's plan for his people is to have this sure, unmistakable relationship with him. And he wants to assure his children about their future. So I ask you, can you say what David said? Surely, certainly, for sure, I know I will live with God's mercy and favor and goodness every day in this life. And I know with certainty I'll live in his house forever in the life to come. That's the heart of the gospel. You were designed by God with the capacity to live in him and to be with him in his very image. But there's a brokenness about us. The Bible says all have sinned. And that's true about you. And you and I had better confront it. Because there's a darkness inside of me. I can deceive. I can be cruel. I can be self-preoccupied and selfish and arrogant and proud. Optimists may deny this, but read the paper. Look in the mirror. Look in your heart. Look in mine. The Bible says it's very serious business, and the wages or the consequences for this is death. It's eternal separation from God. But this just, holy God has no intention of allowing sin or destructiveness to have the last word over his creation. His intention still is that there will be perfect community, and one day there will be, which sets up this enormous problem. It's like, how do we get right 
from God where there's this, this chasm between him and me, this moral gap, like between this perfect, holy, holy God and a fallen, sinful person. And that's the point where a lot of people just kind of settle for a vague hope. Like they think, well, you know, if I just do enough good deeds and go to church enough and, and give enough money and, you know, like I'll kind of like help pay that debt, you know, and don't know, just hope things work out. The Bible says there is no enough. There's no, not, not enough good deeds, not enough things I can do, not enough money I can give. Uh, none, none of that. If I'm on my own with this moral debt between me and God, like I don't have any hope. No hope. Time to find another hope. And God did. That's the gospel. Jesus left his home and came down to this planet, became a human being, and lived in our midst and taught us about what life with God looks like, how it was intended to be. And he was arrested and he died on the cross. The Bible says when he died, he was dying the death that you and I should have died to pay the price that you and I could not pay. The penalty, the wages, the consequences for our, our sin, they fell on him. So as a result, the Bible says the price has been paid. Your debt has been paid. So I can offer you forgiveness now, free, free gift of grace. That's how people are set right with God. And that's what we're going to remember this morning as we gather around the table. But before we do that, let me just ask, have you made that decision? Because you need to do more than just understand you got to decide. Admit you need forgiveness and ask God to forgive you, to receive him as your forgiver and as your leader. If you make that decision, then you too can say, surely, certainly, this is my hope. It's the most important decision a person can ever make. just want us to bow our heads for a moment and pray. Close your eyes if that's kind of helpful for you to focus and some of you are here this morning, and, and maybe, you know, you've been around for a while, but you just never really made that decision. It, it kind of has been floating around, but to really surrender your life to God, that's a hard thing to do. But I want to challenge you right now. If you understand what the gospel is about, and you're ready to take that step, you never made the decision, you need to face the truth, which is, you don't have this sure and certain hope, but you can. So I want to invite you to pray in your spirit as I pray out loud. God, I understand that you love me. I understand that I'm a sinful person. There's a darkness inside of me, and I've fallen short. And I understand I can't do enough, give enough, or work enough to pay that debt. So I'm going to just quit trying. I understand that Jesus came to this earth and died on the cross in my place to pay the debt I could not pay. So now, Father, on this day, I receive forgiveness from you as a free gift of grace. And I offer you my life. I want Jesus to be the forgiver and Lord of my life. And I want to spend every day, best I can, with your power, immersed in your goodness and mercy, and to be with you forever in the life to come. You just need to know if you prayed that prayer and you meant it, you entered into that life. It's the most significant decision a human being can ever make. I'd encourage you to tell somebody if you decided that. Tell somebody who follows Christ, maybe somebody in your family or somebody here at church, just come find me afterwards and tell me so you can begin to grow. Because there's lots of different hopes out there and some of them are quite small. Some of them are pretty large. But this one... It's the only one that's the ultimate hope. This is it. And so that's what we're going to remember together now and celebrate around this table.